Ecclesiastes chapter 5, as we stand, as we honor the Word of God this morning, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. We'll begin in verse number 1, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Scripture says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let more of thy heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. Father, how grateful we are to be just one more time to be able to come into this place and sense your presence. Father, we are in the presence of royalty this morning. The royal blood of Jesus. The royal crown. Father, all the things that you've done for us, and we need to be so mindful of that. Father, certainly we know with those that have gathered, it would be foolish not to know that there are those that are here with heavy hearts. Those, Lord, that are needing God just to do something miraculously. To send an answer. To make a provision away to, uh, available. And Father, I pray that maybe through these words this morning, we can get an answer to our prayers and Maybe we can sense your presence or your direction. Father, how we need you. How we long for the day when we see you close face to face. Father, we are in awe of your word and of your power. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. During the last few weeks, we have... <clears throat> been going through a series called Fools in the Bible. And today we'll finish that series. Uh, this study today is certainly one that we'll certainly have to consider. When we talk about church, many things come to mind. And one of those things is a word called worship. Sometimes our worship can be ineffective. Consider the story of author John Killinger tells about a manager of a minor league baseball te team who got so fed up with his center fielder's performance that he took him out of the game and he played the position himself. The first hard-hit ball came to the manager. It took a bad hop and smashed him in the mouth. The next play was a high fly ball that he lost in the sun until it smacked him in the forehead. The third time the ball came to him was a hard line drive and it flew between his hands and popped him in the eye. Furious, he ran off the field to the dugout, grabbed the center fielder by the shirt, and he shouted, You got center field so messed up that I can't even play it. <laughs> Sometimes if we're not careful, we can get so messed up in our worship that the Lord don't even recognize it. Today, there are all kinds of worship available to church consumers. You have the worship that is stoic, formal, and rigid. Then, of course, you have the uh, worship that is free-flowing, and partic participants get involved. Then you have the place where you come in, sit down, and never move or twitch. And all of these different methods are designed so you can worship the Lord. When you try to, defer, to define the term worship, you get in varied, various responses. Some might believe that worship is music you hear, or maybe the fellowship that you get at the church, or certainly maybe even through the preaching of the Word of God. But think about this. In a very old Webster's Dictionary, published in 1828, listen to this. That dictionary defined worship like this. It, to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. True worship is defined by the priority we place on God in our lives and where God is in our list of, in our priorities. Know this. Worship is all about God. 
It's appropriate to thank God for all that He does for us, seen and unseen. Let me just stop here and let me just tell you this. Some of you might not be aware of this, but God has done some mighty things in your life this week. Sometimes we get so focused on the problems and the situations and all the things we're involved in that we forget to know that there is a God in heaven that ha- now watch that has supplied your needs. And how do I know that? Because you're here this morning. God has supplied your needs. You got up this morning. Your car started this morning. You probably had breakfast or you might have eaten something or you drank coffee. But let me just tell you this. As bad as things may be uh, appear to you right now, I want to tell you there is a God in heaven that loves you and cares for you and desires for you to worship Him. You see, I, I know that we get caught up in all the uh, the the thrills and all of the anxieties and all of the pressures of work and home and life itself. And it's interesting. It's, if you go to any place, it doesn't matter if it's church, it doesn't matter if it's the mall, it doesn't matter where you go, but you can see people are burdened down with life. You can just simply see that the burdens are heavier now maybe than they've ever been. And maybe we just take our burdens a whole lot worse then maybe they really are. I don't know. But the fact is that sometimes we fail to get God to worship that He desires. Now, when we worship our Lord, He sees our hearts. And did you know that when we worship the Lord properly, He gives He gives us permission. We give Him permission to inspect our hearts and our lives. And that's what it's all about. Listen, we desire to be transformed into the image of His likeness so that He can reveal His truth to us. The psalmist had something to say in Psalm 96. And listen, this psalm is just an amazing in a lot of ways. But in Psalm chapter 96 and verse number 6, I want you to see kind of, you kind of get the heart of this psalmist here. He says it this way. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Now watch this. Give unto the Lord, O you kindreds of the people. Give, again, unto the Lord glory and strength. Again, give unto the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. Watch. O worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. Fear before Him. And the Bible says, all of the earth. And did you know that King Solomon had something to say about how we are to come into the sanctuary Or, how we would say, come into the church of today. And I want you to go back, if you will, because we're going to spend a lot of time in Ecclesiastes 5 and verse number 1. Because there are very, very vital truths that you as a worshiper of God and and you as a follower of God need to see this. Now, we'll invite you to always to bring a pen and paper or certainly something where you can underline But I want you to notice this first truth that King Solomon wants you and I to understand. Notice how he phrases this. He says, Keep thy foot when thou goest into the house of God. Keep thy foot. That means to be careful of the conduct and to remember why you are in the house of God in the first place. Wouldn't it be an interesting concept to be mindful when you come into this special place? Now listen... We, sometimes we forget where we are. We come into this place, and, and, and I just want, I want everybody to, to, to think about this. Now watch. Before we dismiss, before we get on with our activities, watch. When we come into this place, we have a rare privilege indeed to come into the conduct of the Lord Jesus, come into His presence, into the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. In other words, when I come into the house of God, I don't just hurriedly come in here. I don't just find my seat. What I have to recognize is, is God is here and the most powerful force on earth that I have the divine privilege of worshiping and bringing His worship into my heart and my heart into His worship. You see, sometimes we just come into the house haphazardly. King Solomon says, keep thy foot. You have to understand when you come into here, watch, watch, when you come into this place, it is a divine privilege. It's not something that you have to dread. It's not something that you have to say, oh my goodness, we have to go to church. No, it is something that we can come and God has, God has fashioned this. 
He has formed this. And watch this. Because He knows man's hearts and He knows the condition of our lives, He says, I have given you worship so that it will help you, it will equip you. And friend, can I tell you this? If you would learn to worship the Lord properly, I can assure you that some of the things that you're hung up about, some of the things that you're mad about, some of the things that, you, that you're upset about, I've got to do all of this next week, or I've got all of this to do. If we would come into the Lord's presence and really worship Him, we might find out that there's... Listen, we might find out there is another side to God than we've ever known before. Did you realize that we don't even touch the hem of His garment when we come into this place? You know, music might move us. Preaching might cause us to do some things. But can I tell you, worship is where God wants to dwell with us, where we need to dwell with Him. You see, when we come into this place, it's not just an ordinary service. It's a place where we can feel and sense His presence. He says, keep thy foot. Recognize where you are, King Solomon says. It is important that you know these thoughts. Now... Imagine stumbling into the house of God loaded down with all your heavy burdens. You are bringing them right to the right place, but you need to bring them the right way. We want to lay our burdens down carefully at the altar rather than violently at His feet. We need to give God our burdens, not the blame. Everybody look up here. We need to give God our burdens, but not our blame. Listen to this. King Solomon was a builder of the temple the most magnificent building that was ever built on earth. Solomon understood that such a place as this should not be entered into carelessly or thoughtlessly. Psalms 100, you know this, you've quoted it in Sunday school. But Psalms 100 in verse number 4, I believe the psalmist has got the footprint of God correct when he writes it this way, Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Now watch this, watch this, watch this. Listen, listen, and listen. Be thankful unto Him. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, I don't believe it. Phil, is that up there on the screen? Can you, can you? Look, look, look at verse number four again. I want you to see this because I think it's crucial that you get this. Everybody look at Psalms 100 before I go on. I want you to see it in your Bible. I want you to identify this before I go on. Psalm 100 and verse number four. Raise your hand when you got it. All right, let me show it to you. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Now watch this. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. Now wait, whoa, 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 whoa. How many of you honestly, legitimately thought when you came into church this morning that you would do that last part of that verse? Look, 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 let's... I'll get down here. Everybody read that last part. Be thankful unto... Whoa, 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 whoa. Come on, come on. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. Wow. That is worship in its purest sense. That is where the Lord wants you to be this morning. Be thankful unto Him. Well, preacher, I don't have nothing to be thankful for. I don't feel good. Uh, everything. No, 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 no. You do have something to be thankful for nothing else. If you are saved and you're redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, you have something to be thankful for. You can praise Him that you're not on the other side. You can praise Him and say, I know that if something happens to me, I'm not going to die and go to the devil's hell. I don't know about you, but that is a thankful thing to say. And bless His name. Well, I don't have nothing to bless His name. Listen. God in His wonder, in His majesty, with His divine creative genius, created this whole world for us to enjoy. Well, I don't enjoy anything because you're not praising Him enough. Have you ever just thought that you ought to stop before you began your day and praise the Lord Jesus Christ? They teach us this. When you begin your prayer life and your devotion life, you are to begin with praise. Lord, I recognize your wonder 
And Lord, I recognize your power and your supremacy. God, I recognize your sufficiency in all things. And I know that you're sovereign. And I know that you created all of this. And Lord, I'm very, very thankful that you have allowed me to get up this morning to experience your day, to experience the things that you're going to bring into my life. Some of them may not be plain, uh, uh, be good to me that I might see, but Lord, I rec- recognize this morning that everything that comes into my life passes through your hands. And because of that, listen, because of that, I can praise you for that. Is anybody plugging in on this this morning? This is something that you and I, I believe, as our present generation, that we're missing. We don't praise Him like that. We don't even understand what it all talks about. Listen, our modern expression, watch your step, comes from Solomon's warning, keep thy foot. When we come into the house of God, we do so to worship and to learn. Have you ever thought, have you really, really, really thought that you come into the house of God to learn. Now, some of you don't learn. Some of you catch up on your nap, and I understand that. Some of you don't want to learn because some of you don't even come with a pen to mark your Bible in the margin and say, man, that's a good thought. You know, that ignorant preacher come up with something good today. I think I'll remember that. You see, you don't come prepared to learn something. Friend, I want to tell you, the only way that I'm going to understand and the only way that I'm going to appreciate what God does is come with a student mentality. Listen, I don't know about you, but I want to learn more about Christ than I knew last week. I want to know more about His sovereignty. I want to learn more about His splendor. And because of that, I can come into the house of God, open the Scriptures, have a preacher, have a teacher, or my own devotions, and learn more of His holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. That ought to be our desire this morning. Now, it's interesting, when you start talking about this, some of us kind of shy away. You see, because I understand in this generation, the word worship offends you. We're, we hear worship so much. We hear worship service. We hear worship songs. and We have worship singers and we have worship that. And we have overused that word and it doesn't mean anything to us anymore. See, w- 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 watch, watch. When we ask you, invite you to come to a worship service, what does that mean to you? Well, typically, here's what it means. Well, I'm so tired, I'm going to drag myself into church, and I'm going to just find my seat, and I'm going to collapse, and he's going to babble for about 30 minutes, and I'm going to go home. That's typically what a modern-day worship service is all about. I don't know about you, but aren't we missing something in that? Aren't we really, really missing something? Because worship is not to be a offense. Worship is to elevate our hearts into God's hearts. A story was told about children playing outside one hot summer day. The dad was inside on this particular Saturday morning, and he heard these children rumble and fight and wrestle and banging against the house and making all kinds of noise. Finally, the man opened the window and asked his kids, What in the world are you doing out here? Why are y'all so loud? What's all this racket about? The story is, his little girl cocked her head, put her hands on her hip, and says, Dad, if you must know, we're just playing church. (laughs) Isn't that what we do? We just play. We just play. When is the last time? Answer this. When is the last time that you came into church and you honestly felt the presence of God? When is the last time that your heart exploded because you just knew God was here? We're talking about we're talking about the God of all creation. The God that knows the number of hairs on your head. The God that formed you and fashioned you in the womb. And he says that I want you to worship me. Modern church is not doing that. Here's what modern worship is all about. We'll sing a song 14 times in a row, these little verses, and that's worship. We get up and preach a 10, 15 minute sermon, that's worship. And we walk out of the doors and we're no better than when we walked in. Isn't that something wrong? Isn't, isn't our worship missing something? Isn't, isn't, isn't a church service ought to be more than just that? 
Listen, we are to gather around the Word of God. We are to, we are to learn the Word of God and appropriate and apply and to let that Word of God be a mirror to our souls. And if God so happens to come your way and meet with you and want you to do something, we are to be gladly to do that. We are to come to Him and say, God, I'm an open book. Read every page of my life. And here I am, God. And if there is something deficient in me, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. A lot of times, we're all guilty of this. We just kind of kind of go through the motions. We go through the motions. And let me tell you what a typical Saturday night li- li- like is at your house. You hurry because you didn't get everything done through your week, so you have to push all your week down on Saturdays. And so it's Saturday evenings, you're still rustling and bustling. And then when you finally fall down, you're so exhausted, and here's what you're thinking. Oh no, it's church tomorrow. My body is so tired. I wonder if that preacher would understand if I just stayed home. The question is this. If you knew that God was here, you would never want to miss again. And see, that's where we're missing. That's where we're missing the whole essence of our worship. You see, we don't expect nothing. We don't bring nothing. We don't contribute nothing. Brother Boone can sing a song, and if we mumble or if we, if we grunt our way through the song, that's okay. But our, but our worship is not near where it ought to be. Because we don't think God's here. If I had a visitation with God every week at Calvary Baptist Church, well, I'd do whatever I could to be here. If God was going to be here every week and and fill my heart with His goodness and His pleasure and His designs for my life, man, I'd be here. Did you know Jeremiah says, God has a plan for every one of you. He has a plan, and He knows the plan that He wants carried out by you. And how do you find out that plan? You come when you worship God. Him. You come when you just give your hearts over to Him. Let me show you something else before we quit. Very quickly. Because we've been studying fools in the Bible these past weeks, you again will find the word in our text verse. Notice what else Solomon says. Uh, boy, this is, this is interesting how he wants to try to teach us this. He says, Be more ready to hear than to give a sacrifice Watch this, of fools. What did Solomon mean by this? He started by saying, be more ready to hear. This is a truth we miss in our present generation. No one has time or the patience to listen for the Lord. Do you recall that special moment when you felt the Lord speaking to your heart about a certain decision? You knew in your heart the Lord wanted you to respond, but now we're just too busy to hear. Dr. Charles Stanley writes, The passive listener comes into a church service and never gives a second thought to what God is speaking. He is not involved in the hearing process. Matthew chapter 7, I I know that you understand this, but look what it says. Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 24. A powerful verse when it talks about this. Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 24. Therefore, watch this, whosoever, you are a whosoever, Heareth these sayings of mine. Now watch this. Not just hears them. Look what he says. And doeth them or does them. I will liken him unto a wise man. Which built his house on a rock. Look what he was saying. Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine. If you put into practice the things that I'm trying to teach you. And you hear my words. And you actively are involved in my worship. Then I'm going to liken you to a wise man. Now I don't know about you. But I could probably use a little bit more wisdom. And there it is in our, in our, in our foundation of the word of God. Our solid foundation of our lives comes from aggressively lit hearing and doing what the word says. Skip over, if you will, to Psalm chapter 81, verse number 8. And let me show you something. Very interesting verses here. Psalm chapter 81, verse number 8. Hear, O my people, and I will testify unto thee, O Israel. Now watch. If thou will hearken or listen unto me, watch. 
There shall be no strange God be in thee, neither shall thou worship any strange God. I am the Lord thy God which brought thee out of Egypt. Now watch what he says. Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people would not hearken or listen to my voice. And Israel would not none of me. So I gave them up to their own heart's lust. And they walked in their own counsels. Listen at this painful verse here. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. I should soon have subdued their enemies, turned my hand against their adversaries. Wow! You know what God was saying? All you had to do was listen to me. If you would have listened to me, I would have come down and done some mighty works in your midst. Calvary Baptist Church, if you would listen to God, I wonder what He would do in your midst. The Bible says here, He would come down and He would have taken care of all of their enemies. What did Israel do? They turned their back on God, says, I don't want to listen to you anymore because I have my own way, I have my own counsels, and I have my own ideas. God was asking the nation of Israel, please listen to me, please hear my voice. Each one of us should ask, Lord, have you been trying to tell me something that you wanted me to hear? Wonder how many times the Lord has told you something important, but you refused. Did you know that the Lord still speaks to us powerfully as He did in the, in the Bible days? Now listen to this. Brother Phil, if you find it, go ahead and punch those next thoughts up on the screen, if you can find it. How do I know that the Lord still speaks? Number one, because He loves us just as much as He loved the people in the Old and the New Testament. Amen. He loves... Wait, 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 wait. He loves you. And He wants you to listen to His voice. Now, the only way that you're going to listen to His voice, number one, you have to know Him as your Savior. Amen. Number two, Phil, how do I know He listens? How do I know He talks? Because he, we still need His de- definite direction as much as the saints of old. Stay right there, Phil. Friend, let me tell you this. If the saints of the Old Testament needed God's direction and pushing and prodding, how much do you think we need it today? Friend, that's not ever changed because I know He speaks because we still need His direction. Number three, look at this. Because He knows we still need the comfort and assurance just as much as ever before. Can I tell you this? I need Christ more this week coming up than I did last week. I need His direction. I need His assurance. Have you ever been praying this lately? God, would you just show me what to do? Have you ever prayed that prayer? Lord, would you just give me your assurance that I'm walking the way you want me to walk? Friend, listen, He loves us and He knows we need His assurance. Look at the next one, Phil. Go ahead. Um, Is that the last one, Phil? All right. Listen to this. It's important that we understand this. Phil, there's one more right there. Because he still wants us to, listen, he still wants us to know him just as much as in the past. Can I tell you this? Guys, if, 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 if Abraham and Isaac and Jacob want, God wanted them to know, and Peter and Paul and those of the New Testament, he wanted them guys to know, he still wants us to know him. And the way that he does that, he wants to speak to our hearts. Listen to this. Sometimes there's so much noise out there, we can't discern the right from the wrong. Let me skip some stuff, and I want you to go to a very, 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 very important verse in your Old Testament. Find the very last book of the Old Testament, if you will. The very, very, very last book of the Old Testament. And I'll show you something important here. Malachi chapter, if you will. Malachi, the Old book, uh, Old Testament book of Malachi chapter 1. I want to show you this. Verse number 12, Malachi chapter 1 and verse number 12. What a, this is, this is almost inexcusable. Almost, you, you, you wouldn't think this would be in your Bible. It says, but you have profaned it, and that you say the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. Look at verse 13. But ye said, Behold, what a weariness, underscore that word weariness, and put a circle around that. What a weariness it is, and ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And you brought that which was torn and lame and sick, and you brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand? Go ahead, Phil. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? Listen, these people had lost the respect for worship. You will notice in verse number 13, they said the word weariness. They thought it became too much effort to worship the Lord anymore. Listen, wait a minute. Is anybody listening to this? 
they said, Lord, you're requiring too much for us. Lord, it's just too much for us to go to the temple. And the prophet goes on and says this, You have brought which was torn and lame and sick, and you brought an offering, and should I accept this of your hand? Listen to what he was saying. The Lord says in the Old Testament, when you brought an offering to the Lord, it was supposed to be the very, come on, come on, come on. It was supposed to be the very best. And because these people did not care about worshiping the Lord, you know what they were doing? They were bringing their old, torn, sick, and, 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 and pitiful sheep to the temple and says, Lord, I'm going to give you this. Brandon, I can tell you this. You can measure your heart with your worship by the way you give. Whoa. Nobody like that. But nobody like that. You can tell your worship by the way you give. You see, if you're willing to give, you're willing to worship. And if you're willing to worship, you're willing to give. You see, friends, that just goes hand in hand. These people says, it's just too much. Lord, you're just asking too much of us. I don't want to bring you the best. I don't want to bring you what I should bring. I'm just going to give you my leftovers and you should be satisfied with that. Watch, watch. Everybody watch up here. Are we not in that same vein today? Lord, I'm going to give you my leftovers. I'm not going to give you the best. I'm not going to tithe. I'm not going to give you the best of my tithe, so you just take my leftovers. Lord, I'm not going to give you the best of my worship, so you're just going to have to take what I give you. Look at verse number 10 of Malachi chapter 1, verse number 10. I want you to see this. Malachi chapter 1 and verse number 10. Who is there among you that should shut the doors for naught? Now, boy, catch this verse. Neither do you kindle fire on my altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, Neither will I accept an offering. Go ahead, Brother Phil, that next one. At your hand. Here's what he was saying. Listen to this. Listen at this powerful verse. And if there is ever an Old Testament verse that needs to be taught, it is certainly this one. Look what he says. He says this. <clears throat> because they had lost their desire for worship, they would bring the Lord their worst instead of the best. He says this. When love dies, your gifts decline. And they thought they could deceive the Lord in what they were doing. Now, listen to this. Solomon says, all of this behavior is foolish. We can get so caught up in the formality of worship, which means we come so formal with our doings of service that literally means nothing. We can sit under fiery preaching, devoted singing, and inspirational prayers, and yet we can leave unmoved. Notice what Solomon had to say lastly in, in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 5 and verse number 1, For they consider not that they do evil. The word evil means harm, distress. King Solomon in his day knew that people's hearts were falling away. Now can I tell you this as I close? King Solomon had an insight. In his day, listen, listen. In his day, people were already falling away. Or, okay, let me bring in. Let me bring in. Everybody just peer up. Sit at the edge of your seats and I'm done. I'm done. I'm, I've skipped some pages this morning just to make you happy. Okay? Now watch. King Solomon says, you don't even care in, in, in what we looked at. You don't even care in Malachi that the church is going to be closed. That, that, that temple is going to be closed. That don't mean nothing to you. you. You'd be okay if the doors of the temple were closed. How many people today would even care if Calvary Baptist Church sign was taken down and the church doors were locked and padded, who, who, who would even care? Who would even care that you'd say, well, the Lord don't speak to me in times past because it's just not the way it is, preacher. We're in the 21st century and we're just, we're just, a, we're just a, a new generation. No, we're not a new generation. We're a selfish generation. We, it's all got to be about us. And the reason why we don't worship is because you're not involved. You, 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 you're not to get the praise. You see, when I worship God, it deflects all praise from me up unto Him. And by the way, that's how it all always should be. Beloved, we didn't sacrifice our son on your behalf. Beloved, we didn't create this world and create you in the womb. Lord, we didn't, we didn't create you with this hole in our hearts that only God could satisfy. Some of you are going so many different directions in your week and you're trying to find happiness and contentment and you can only find happiness and contentment at the feet of Jesus Christ. I just wonder how many times have we let this week go by and we didn't worship Him. Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1-3 through 3 said that's foolish. You coming in the house of God and you're not even worshiped. That's foolish. I don't even understand what you're doing that for. What, 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 where's your heart? 
I shouldn't say this, but here it is. Some of you in this room, some of you will go home and worship the Dallas Cowboys more than you'll worship the man who paid your price for your sins. Yesterday in sports stadiums all over America, 105,000 people were gathered at this one stadium. They had their faces painted in school colors and they would chant nonstop. The stadium was so loud that would even say that, that, listen to this, the stadium was so loud you could feel the ground shake over football. We can't even get the ground shake at a, at a Baptist church. We can't even get people to worship God when He is here. When He is saying, come, come unto me all you that are labor and heavy hearted. I'll give you rest. Come on to me. Come on to me. But you will not. You will not. The people in Malachi's day would not bring the best. Malachi says you don't even care if the temple would be closed. It wouldn't make any impact in your life. Why? They were so busy of doing their activities that they squeezed God plumb out of their lives. Let me ask you this. I know it's funny to think about it. Here we go. What happens? What happens if God's people got it excited at church as they do at football stadiums? Nothing that happened on those football fields all over America yesterday has any impact on my life. It doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't matter who wins or loses. As a matter of fact, I'll say something heresy in a Baptist church. I don't care if Cowboys win or lose. It's not going to make one impact on my life. But what is going to make an impact on my life is my closeness to Christ. It's my desire to worship Him my desire to get as close to Him as humanly possible. Some of you came in here with your burdens heavy. Some of you told me, Preacher, this has been a difficult week. It was just hard to get through. Some of you have got doctor's appointments that was challenging up ahead. Some of you have got relational problems within your very own family. You're worried about your children. You're worried about some member of your family not knowing Christ. But the last time you worshiped God was so many weeks ago. You know what he was saying? Just like Israel, open your mouth and I will fill it. Open your mouth for me and I will give you something that the world cannot give you. I'll give you peace. I'll give you satisfaction. And I'll give you me. I'll give you something that you, you, you couldn't even buy in a grocery store. Come and get this peace. Come and get this worship. Come and fall on your face and say, Oh God, I am so deficient of you. Lord, I'm just like the nation of Israel with every head bowed and eye closed. Lord, I'm just like the nation of Israel. I have stumbled through a routine lately. I've stumbled through my life. My worship is not invigorating like it used to be. It's been so long since I've felt the presence of divine God in my midst that, Lord, I don't even know what worship is all about. Some has already come because they're concerned with the direction of their life and concerned with the direction of their worship. You have problems this morning? Come to the feet of Jesus. You got lost family members? Come to the feet of Christ. You're not functioning where you are to function? Come to the foot of cross. Is your worship stale and ineffective? Come to the feet of Christ. Yeah, you can rush through life, but what is it getting you? sit in the same seats every week we hear the same voice every Sunday but the voice we're so deficient is Christ it's 
today, and would you sing this quietly and tenderly? Would you stand with me all over the building? There's still room for you this morning. Say, God, I don't want to leave this building without hearing from you.